All right. What's up, coaches and everybody listening? This is Corey Harris with The Transition, a real resource for coaches. I am joined by my special guest, my man, Daniel Poneman. Thank you so much for your time, bro. It's an honor. Thanks for having me. I mean, I'm excited. I love, I love following your stuff on social media. I'm really excited to be here talking to you. For sure, for sure. So let's jump straight into it because this is a super busy time of the year for agents like yourself. Um, take us back for a little bit to like those swag air days. I was doing a little bit of digging. I went back to your, your YouTube channel and I saw just kind of how you got your start. Um, how are you so ahead of your time and, and where did you even get the idea to jump straight into the industry the way that you did? Yeah, well, it's funny. Now people know me as Dan, the agent or whatever I'm doing now. But like every once in a while, I'll walk in a gym and someone will shout out Swag Air. And they remember where I started. You know, yeah. I was grassroots before with social media. I was doing, I was blogging. I was making highlight videos right when YouTube dropped for top high school players. I was in high school myself, you know, just never thought it would be a business, never thought it would be a career. I was just a kid following my passion, following my curiosity. I loved high school basketball. I love following recruiting. I love, you know, uh, being a, a resource for college coaches. Um, and now here I am 17 years later. And it's funny, like I was talking to a recruit, a recruit's mother the other day, someone I was recruiting. And she was like, yeah, you know, did you just start doing this, you know, recently? Or, I'm like, yo, I'm going to do this shit. Like, I was 14 years old when I started. I'm 31 now. I really do this. This is really uh, my life's work. And, um, you know, it's had different chapters from the blog days to the Swag Air YouTube days to making Shot in the Dark, my documentary, to becoming an agent. And But the through line through all of it is just that, like, I follow my curiosity. I follow my passion. I do what's fun. I do what's interesting and try to help people. For sure. For sure. Can you help me understand, like, where that ingenuity came from? Because like you say, you're 14, 15, 16 years old, you're traveling to like out of state tournaments, you're you're tracking like some of the nation's best players on the AAU circuit. How are you doing that at such a young age? I mean, for me, it was, I think with time comes self awareness. But at that age, I wasn't self aware, which was a strength, it was a superpower. Like I wasn't thinking I'm 14, 15 years old. I'm too young to run a recruiting site. I'm too young to give information to college coaches. I don't really know anything, right? I didn't think that way. I was young and green and optimistic and, and life hadn't beat me down or told me that I couldn't. So to me, right. being 15 years old, starting a website and writing scouting reports and going up to college basketball coaches at AAU tournaments and saying, hey, I'm Dan Poneman. If you want to recruit Chicago, you need to know me. And a yeah. lot of people their eyes. But then a lot of them were like, this kid has confidence. Let me talk to him. And those are some mm -hmm. of my friends to this day. I was just talking to Dennis Gates at Missouri and reminiscing how when he was an assistant at Northern Illinois and he was 25 years old, I was 15 trying to help him with recruiting. And some of those people who did believe in me when I was 15 years old and just, you know, uh, a bright, you know, sunny young kid, you know, that, that, that the world hadn't gotten to yet, you know, and now those are some of my strongest relationships in the game. Um, and I think, yeah, it was just like, I, I hope that everybody could approach life with that childlike confidence and wonder of that. Yeah. Like, who, who are you to tell me I can't just because I'm my, yeah. age, just because of my background. And I've hopefully carried that, that, that confidence through me in life with maybe just a little more, um, realism as well. For sure. You just answered what was going to be my next question. And that was, you know, we have a lot of young coaches, skill development trainers, aspiring, you know, agents, front office professionals that watch uh, these podcast interviews and a lot of them may be insecure about their background and their upstart like I didn't play on a high level or I didn't you know come from a coaching background or my parents aren't you know from the basketball industry so just you having that fearlessness I think helps whoever's listening to understand that they could do the same thing in whatever their field is so that's good stuff yeah and on that note like I think there's you have to have the confidence and the realisticness. You have to, to weigh them both. Okay. But you can like know that you have one life on this earth. Don't let anybody tell you that your dreams aren't possible. Don't let anybody tell you that you can't manifest exactly what it is that you want out of life. And don't let anybody tell you not to go for it if it's in your heart. This, this is a magical universe and, and go for whatever you want to manifest. But at the same time, recognize that these are highly competitive industries. And you have to be strategic about how you can add value and how you can advance. Mm -hmm. Like I have people that 
interview for jobs with me and they'll say, oh, I've just always wanted to be an agent and I know I'm really good at scouting. I've just always wanted this. And it's like, bro, I don't give a shit what you want. That ain't helping me. That's great that you want it and go for that. But that's not enough to just to just believe in yourself. It's a highly competitive industry. You have to think of ways to add value. And for me, when I was young, I was adding value. I was giving free. I would go to college. Uh, I would go to high school basketball tournaments where there's a ton, ton of college coaches. And I would spend weeks before researching every single player in the tournament. And I was mm-hmm. handing out free booklets to the college coaches because there, there's maybe seven, you know, 16 to 32 teams in a, in a, a Christmas tournament. I'm walking yeah. up in a booklet of the top 30 players in the event, their phone numbers, who's recruiting them, my scouting report. I'm doing their jobs for them. <laughs> right. Popping the gold. And they're like, what, what is, what is this? Like, this is my job you just did for me. And now I know who I'm watching their phone numbers. I just saved them ton, tens of hours of work and didn't ask for a penny. Here, did your job for you. And now they come back 10 years later and still remember that I helped them when they were a first year assistant. Now these guys are head coaches. So I was being creative in how to add value. You have to believe in yourself, but you always got to hustle too. And you got to work for free to get your foot in the door. And I know that's challenging for some people who might not have the financial resources, but if in this industry, you got to be willing to work for free. You got to be willing to sleep on the couch. You got to be willing to eat, eat in the dining hall at the D3 school and, you know, and then, then work your way up from there. So that was years ago, you know, over a decade. Fast forward now, it's 2023. The world has, has changed. Things are a little bit faster, right? Everybody's more interconnected. But you still have kids who are looking to translate their passion for maybe they played high school basketball, but they know they're not going to get the chance to play in college or they know they won't get the chance to go to the pro levels after college. How do they now transition into the professional side of sports? Because you did it in a time where you had to be like right there on the ground floor, like hustling, like you explained. But now they have so many more like avenues. Like what would you say to that? college player who's graduating in the next month or two well the key really is building your career before you graduate like i've been advising kids on nil for instance on how do you make nil money in college well the key is building relationships with boosters donors and local businesses being early to all your when you get a paid appearance be early learn everyone's name get their numbers stay late because then when they have that you know, that nonprofit event or that country club event, they're going to call you first. They're going to remember, oh, this is the player who shows up early and is really nice to everyone and and stays late. And 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 you're going to end up not only getting money from that during your playing career, but after your playing career too, because when they need alumni to come back, oh, that's yeah. the guy you to work with. Conversely, if you're the guy who shows up late, you're on your phone all the time, act arrogant, don't remember people's name, they're not booking you again. So like on mm-hmm. the NFL side, I've been telling guys like, so much of your money when you're at a big time school is going to come from building relationships in the community. Yes. Yeah. Those for your career after basketball, where you have to build that career when you're still playing, because there's going to be a time when you're done playing and you have to go back to every coach you coach for every athletic director you, you played under all the, the, the boosters and donors at those organiz- at those schools that own businesses. And if you were an asshole to them, they ain't taking the call. But if you throughout your four or five years of college, every coach, feels like you listened and you were really coachable. And the team manager who was washing your jerseys, uh, turns out his dad owns a hedge fund, right? And, and he remembers that you thanked him for washing your jersey. You thanked him every time you rebounded for you. And you maybe gave him a little of your NIL money to, to th- you know, took him out to eat because he rebounded for you. And that booster who was paying you $10,000 to come do an appearance at his country club, well, he loved what you did at that appearance. And now you got a job at his construction company, right? All those relationships you make while you're playing, that's what leads to your post-playing career. But if you wait till you're done playing and then change your tune and try to come back and it's too late, it's too late. That's right. What he showed you and now you're changing up because you want something. You got to be a good person the whole way through and then your opportunities will be limitless. Love that. Love that. Build your playing, build your career while you're still playing. Uh, You you talked a, a little bit about the NIL process, right? For those parents who are out there or coaches who are out there watching this what is an nio and then what are some of the misconceptions that people are having right now when it comes to what they think is like i guess free money now and like what should they expect what's the sliding scale is everybody you know sitting at the table getting the same amount on their plate like 
break it down for us just for a little bit. Well, it's a completely new frontier. When the NCAA changed the NIL rules and name, image, and likeness rules three years ago, I think they didn't um, anticipate how much it would change the game because and they and as a result they didn't like tighten the rules enough they left so much gray area they left it so open-ended that there's so much money in college sports that people found ways to work within the rules yeah. to completely transform the game the NCA probably thought oh uh people get a you know a, a deal at the local pizza shop and uh, the local car dealership and maybe guys like Zion or Drew Timmy will get a national deal but it won't affect everybody else but what's happened at all these big schools across the country is the boosters and the donors and the businesses that used to donate millions of dollars to um, a new practice facility or putting PlayStations in the locker room or a private plane. They're just, they're, 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 they used to just donate to the program. They're putting this money in things called NIL collectives. And I saw something the other day that um, I think it was Ohio State is like doing an event to raise money from fans for their NIL collective. And that money basically gets distributed to the players. At some wow. schools, it's evenly distributed across everyone on the team. Some schools, there's a baseline that everyone gets, and then some guys can earn more. And some schools, it's just completely different for every player based on performance or whatever. But it has to be, and the money has to be in exchange for use of name, image, likeness. There is no pay to play. You can't, the collective can't just say, here's your money to play basketball. It has to be, here's the money for making appearances at local businesses, community service, um, uh, posting on your Instagram about local businesses, that player has to exchange marketing services that you use your name, image, and likeness in exchange for that money. So they're not just giving away free money. Gotcha. You still have to work for it. You still have to use yeah. it. Your- but these collectives have pulled together communities of boosters, donors, fans, businesses, and made their players. I mean, everyone knows the Nigel Pack thing at, at Miami, but there are schools across the country where guys are making huge money. And some people are saying, oh, it's ruining the game. Oh, guys are getting paid. Well, it didn't ruin Miami. All <laughs> right, right. So there's Good harmony point. in that locker room because everyone's getting paid and everyone's happy, and they don't have to worry about yeah. you know scraping the other dimes to to buy a pizza. So yeah. it's great, but at the same time, it, there there aren't a lot of guardrails. So I believe the way it's going to change is that they're not going to like go back in time. They're not going to stop guys from getting paid. They're just going to have to find better ways to structure it so that guys can continue getting paid more and more. And I believe the money will get bigger and bigger, but just ways that are more structured than it is currently. Got you. I saw one of your posts. Um, I don't know if it was recent or a few months ago, but you were like telling players to stop putting this like copy paste Instagram bio where they're just like, Hey, I'm open for NIL inquiries or, or, you know, like what are you seeing that athletes and or parents are doing now since the NIL has come into play that is either setting them up for, you know, a pitfall or maybe they're just acting out of ignorance. Like what, what are just some precautionary, I guess, tales you can give us when it comes to handling the NIL properly? I would say make sure you're using a qualified, experienced agent okay. in that process. Again, like obviously I'm going to say that because I'm a qualified, experienced agent. I've been doing this for 17 years, even though NIL has only been around for three, I've been doing this for 17 years, but because people see the money in the space and it's not like, um, like for the NBA, you have to pass a certification process, right? We have to take a test. We have to pay annual dues. There's a vetting system for NBA agents. Right. NIL NCA has not created an agent vetting system. So anybody mm-hmm. can walk up off the street and say, I'm an NIL agent. I'm going to get you deals. I've seen yeah. horrors of agents locking guys into five-year contracts of agents charging 30, 40% commissions uh, of, of these absurd things because there's no regulation. There's no vetting of agents. So the first thing I would say is if you're going to work with an agent, make sure this is a, a certified, experienced agent. Um, okay. Second thing I would say is um, your social media is a reflection of you. So if you're, I mean, we, we've been saying this for years, but it's like players can build their brand by marketing themselves through social media. A lot of these NIL deals, it's straight up, how many followers do you have and will pay for a post per follower? So a lot of guys want to get the paid posts, but don't want to do what they have to do to build their social media following to have a following for them to pay to post, right? You got two followers and you post once once a month. No one's paying for that. But if you're working with fans, engaging the audience, 
you're building your audience. Now people might give you two, three, four, five thousand dollars for a post. For sure. For um, sure. The last thing is what I said before: engaging with the community. Most of this yeah. NIL is coming from boosters, donors, fans of the school. Get out there in the community, meet people, get their numbers, look them in the eye, shake their hand, kiss the babies. You know, like like do what you have to do in the community because people are going to want to support players from the program. And if you want to be the one to get the NIL deal, you might have to market yourself a little bit to do that. For sure. For sure. So, I, man, you're dropping so many gems. I hope people are taking notes. Let's backtrack a little bit. Um, you talked and touched on just your experience with dealing with college coaches and being a resource for them. So I'm sure in those experiences, you began to see through their eyes and know what they wanted in a player. For anyone that's watching this who maybe has the question of like, what is a division one player? Like, is there a sliding scale? Is there some sort of like unspoken rubric that only college coaches know that the rest of the world doesn't? Like, how does a, a player or even a coach, someone working with players like a skill trainer, how do they know if what they're looking at is a potential division one, division two, D3? Like, how would you break that down? Well, what's interesting is that that's changed over the last few years because gotcha. of the portal. So the first thing is you are the level you are recruited at, okay? So you might be a better player, but like I get this all the time where like I have a, you know, a kid I'm talking to is in the transfer portal. He's like, hey, Dan, all the schools recruiting me are mid-major. Can you call some high majors for me? I'm trying to go high major. I'm like, buddy. If there's 30 high majors calling you or 30 mid majors calling you and no high majors, that means you're a mid major player. And maybe you can go over overachieve there, but it don't make no sense for me to call high majors and convince them to, to sign you. And then you're just going to be a bench player there anyway, because they don't really value you. Like believe the level that you're recruited at. And the beautiful thing is now you can transfer up. So what's changed about the game in the last few years is that it used to be um, if you're a top 300, 350 player in the country, you're going high major every year. Okay. That's gone way down because of the transfer portal. So right. now if you look across the teams in the final four, I think there's only like one freshman starter across 20 guys, right? Like if I'm advising a freshman who's a really good player, who's not a McDonald's all American, I'm saying go level down. Okay. Go to a mid-major plus, go to a mid-major, prove yourself and then transfer up because at wow. these major schools, their, their whole rosters, but their whole starting lineups are transfer portal guys. They want these 21, 22, 23 year old guys, right? So freshmen, even if they're talented, are not getting the opportunities to start at the high majors. So I, I see it more as a system where the best high school players are going to go D2, low major, mid major. You prove yourself. And after a year or two, you transfer up rather than going right to a high major, going to the highest level where there's going to be a transfer starting over you for two years. And then you're two years in with no film. Wow. wow. So it, the transfer portal has completely changed the way we're building rosters at the NCAA, at the, the D1 level. But I think it's it's good. It, 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 it balances things out. Marquise Noel at Kansas State, he came from Little Rock. A lot of these stars in the tournament came from mid-majors where they started to put up numbers, transfer high. Hmm. And you're going to see a lot of these high-major guys who go there as a freshman transferring down because they never got time. So again, I guess the point is you are the level you're getting recruited at. Believe Got that, you. go there. And if you outperform, great, you can move up. Got you. That makes a lot of sense. And I guess that's a major key in a parent and player's recruitment process. Are there like a couple others that you would just throw out and say, if you're a high school player going through your recruitment process, like right now school is winding down, guys are probably going to start taking visits if they haven't already finished. But what would you tell even a kid that's not in the top 300 or not you know ranked ESPN whatever how, how would they or how should they approach their recruitment process just from a generic perspective if you're getting recruited and you have offers go with who wants you not who you want don't chase down okay. a school that that you're waiting for them to offer go with the school that really really wants you because that's where you're going to play a lot and you're going to be valued go with the people who really really want you don't wait yes. and maybe get a late offer and the next thing is if you're not getting recruited don't expect anyone else to save the day. You have to be your own advocate. I get families of players, high school kids call me all the time. Hey, Dan, can you get me an offer? And it's like, I don't have time to call 20 schools for you. You have to 
put your resume together, together, put your highlight tape together, go online, look up the D3, D2 conferences in your area and individually email every single coach from those conferences and say, hey, this is my name, this is my stats, this is my grades, this is my film. I would love if you would consider me. Don't don't mass email, individually email every single coach. Okay. Every college website has their coach's email on there. So my thing is, don't expect me or your coach to come save the day and get you an offer and do the legwork. If you, it's just like when you're getting a job as an adult, if you want to get what you want to get out of life, do the legwork, carve out two hours yeah. to email coaches and someone's going to take you on because they're going to recognize the ingenuity and the sincerity and the fact that you took the time to email and they're going to give you a shot, but you got to do the legwork. And the same thing goes on the other end. I get all the time college players who averaged eight points per game at a mid-major saying, damn, will you represent me to go pro? No, nah, there's not much money in that. And I, I ain't taking, I ain't taking, you know, hours out of my day to find you a job. But yeah, you can go online, find out the names of the pros, pro teams, find out every G League team has an open tryout. Right. Figure out when they are. So my advice, if you're go, if you're coming out of college and no agent is recruiting you, but you want to play pro, well, you got to be your own agent. Go on Eurobasket, go on uh, Real GM. Find the names of the teams, find the, the emails, put your resume together. You're going to have to send hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of emails. You're not going to <laughs> right. go to uh, overseas pro camps where it's 100 people and only one guy gets a mm-hmm. job, but you got to hustle. Mm-hmm. People think I have a magic wand. Even Sometimes I tell a dude, like, even if I wanted to make it my full-time job to get you a job overseas, you average seven points a game. No one's going to sign you. You have to go to the camps. You have to hustle. You got to make your own way. And guys don't get that. I don't have magic right. fairy dust. That's right. That's right. Man, I hope people are really tuning in and like listen to exactly what you're saying, because there's no yellow brick road, I guess, you know, to, to success. You got to find your way. Um, So you're already talking about the pro game a little bit. It's like you, you're reading my notes, bro. But uh, help us uh, and the people watching to understand some of the misconceptions of playing like overseas or even like G League. Like I, I deal with a lot of guys who they say, Oh, I know I can't play in the NBA, but I'll just go overseas or I can't make it in the NBA, but I'll just go to the G League as if it's like, you know, just some building around the street or, you know, something they can just, you know, I don't know, ask one someone for directions to and just get there quickly. Like explain to the players out there and the coaches so that they can have a better understanding of how to address their players. What does it actually mean? What does it take? And then describe like, the average overseas contract because they don't believe me when I try to explain it to them and I coached overseas, but maybe it'll, it'll make more sense if you explain it. For sure. And if we have to go over time, don't worry about it. I'm enjoying this. Um, okay. <laughs> um, oh, man. I'll, I'll skip lunch today. Cause this is a lot of fun. Um, so I hear that a lot, like guys saying, Oh, I don't want to do my fifth year of college. I'll just go pro. I'm like pro what? Basketball? Cause <laughs> That's, I had that the other day. Someone was a kid in the transfer portal hit me up. Didn't like his options in the portal because they were all mid major. So he was like, "I think I'm just gonna go pro." I'm like, "So you mean to tell me that none of the high majors want you, and you think a professional team is gonna want you? That's ridiculous." Like, the G League is one of the most competitive leagues in the world. There are times I have clients in the G League where I'm watching G League games, and every person on the floor has NBA experience. Like I have a client on the Delaware Bluecoats. I think their top eight guys all have NBA experience, whether they were drafted or on a two-way or on a roster. These aren't just like, you know, like 15 years ago when it was the D-League. These are like right. real dudes. So right. on the D-League roster, the first few guys are ros- like, you know, NBA roster guys that are that are on, uh, you know, relegated, you know, for, uh, you know, on assignment. Then there's the mm-hmm. contract guys. Then there's what they call the Exhibit 10 guys, which are, they were right. Camp with the NBA team. So your first eight guys or so are all not G League players, essentially. They're NBA guys on, on assignment. And, and For assignment. sure. Yep. So now the back end of the roster, you also might have guys like, I was watching the game the other day, Alfred Payton is, in, is in, on a G League contract. Uh, Chris Dunn was on a G League contract yep. the year. Uh, yep. Norris Cole, like they, a lot of these G League roster guys, Kenneth Fareed, are like dudes who played in the league. Yeah, veterans. Veterans. So if you're a young dude and you're just on a regular GD contract and you're on that eight through 11 or 12 spot, you're at risk of getting cut every day. And you're just, 
you're in a in a tough spot. You're you're hanging on for for dear life. And not to mention that everybody wants those spots. There's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and thousands of people who want that eight through twelve spot because it's cozy to be in the G League instead of overseas. Now, conversely, if you're going overseas, there's not a job out there for everyone. Like if if you're a dude who played Division One on a good team and averaged double figures, there might be a good job out there for you. Might be even if you're like if you just missed getting drafted, you might get a six figure job as a rookie, maybe. But for the majority of guys, even for all conference players, guys who average double figures on winning teams, your starting job in Europe is maybe 20 to 50,000. And that's for the cream of the crop your first year. And then that number can go up over the course of your career. But for the vast majority of guys, if you played D2 when you were all conference, or if you were a, a good starter at the division one level, there's this massive group of thousands of players all fighting for these jobs that are $1,000 a month, $1,500 a month. You might be sharing an apartment with three other people. The, the, the heat might not work. Uh, you nope. might not have a car there. Nope. Uh, they might uh, be late on payments. Uh, so, some of your salary might be paid in uh, free meals at the local restaurant. Like I had a dude I talked to last year who was a D2 player. And was like, Dan, can you help me go overseas? I said, bro, with your resume, the only jobs you can get are jobs you do not want. And he mm -hmm. didn't. So some uh, European agent hit him up on Facebook and he took the job in some godforsaken country. And he called <laughs> him, Dan, you got to get me out of here. There's nine of us sharing one bathroom. Uh, our, our shower has roaches. I'm making $700 a month. They're smoking cigarettes yeah. in the arena. There's no air conditioning. I'm like, bro, I told you, you just graduated college. You could have got a job at fucking Enterprise Rent-A-Car for $60,000 in health insurance. You over in damn host. <laughs> Mom, bro. Like I told you it was going to happen. So for some guys, it's a fun experience to just try something different and see the world. But yeah. it's, not, it's not a real professional path. Right, right. No, you got to love it. You have to love it. I was just talking with uh, my god brother. We played Division three basketball together. And he told me when we were in college, this was seven years ago, he said, I want to play overseas. And so I'm not an agent, but I had a few connections and I helped him get some representation. The dude started off making $200 a month. And over the six, seven years, he, he kind of climbed a little bit of a ladder to it. He got up to, you know, a couple thousand a month. Um, Kyle Falk, who plays right now for the Lao Ning Leopards, he told us his first year he was making 1100 a month in Ireland, and now he's making, you know, 1.3. But that's over a decade of, of traveling, playing in different leagues, and he had to win in every league. And he played at University of Arizona, right, Power 5. So 1100 a month, 200 a month, like, you, you got to love it. It's, it's a grind. There's no uh, guarantee that, like you said, that you're going to find – uh, the best place for you. So uh, real quick, let's just kind of talk more about you, right? And what you have going on, like your day to day right now, obviously is different from the swag air days. Um, break down just some of like the things that you experience, like for those who might want to be agents or are just curious, you know, as to what that actually means. Like, what are some of the responsibilities you have? Yeah, well, I'm an independent agent, so I don't have a huge staff. So me and my partner, Mike, um, do everything ourselves. We have some support staff, but like we, we every day is different. Some days, you know, um, you know, I have a client who is in the NBA slam dunk contest. Who's been getting a lot of endorsement deals recently. So a lot of zooming and talking to our partners at shoe companies and, and, you know, shout out to Puma, um, you sure, know, for sure. a lot of that management watching client games, you know, I'm watching NBA games, G league games and overseas games and college games, um, you know, recruiting college players, you know, the transfer portal is moving. So everyone's following me for information and I'm, you know, trying to advise players and coaches and, you know, kind of just be at the, I'm, I'm because I have such a long history in the college scouting world before I was a, a agent, I'm always kind of involved in the transfer market. Um, I, uh, what else? My life is, is unique too. I produce movies. I, yeah, I, yeah. But I have a showcase coming up in two weeks. So I do. I've been for 14 straight years. I've been doing a free high school showcase for unsigned seniors in Chicago for kids who finish their senior year that don't have a scholarship offer to college. We invite like 100 JUCOs, D2s, D3s, and NAIA, NAIAs to Chicago to get those kids seen. It's a free showcase. Wow. So I've been doing that for 14 years. We help, you know, usually 40, 50 kids a year get to school, mostly JUCO kids. 
And that's what I do to give back. Um, so for me, every day is different, but that's how I like it. I think for some agents, it's very straightforward. It's like negotiate contract, manage client, watch game, repeat. But for me, yeah. I, I, every day is different for me. And I, I see life as a, an adventure and, and it's just, I, I love the surprises it brings me every day. And, and I hope it never changes. You just strike me as the type of person that's a builder. Like you don't wait on things to be constructed and already put together to like jump on the, the bandwagon and go along for the ride. Um, and I commend you for that, bro. Like, I don't know you, but it, you just strike me as that, you know what I mean? So I'm just going kind of off the cuff right now. and just speaking from, from the heart. So shout out to you. Um, what's, what's the difference though, between a, a good agent and a shady agent? Like how can somebody who's not in the profession differentiate between the two? The most I mean, there's certain cutoffs, right? Like an agent has to be competent. Agent has to be like uh, at least okay at math, has to have good relationships in the NBA and college and overseas. Like there are okay. cutoffs like competence, right? But once you get above that line of competence of like, is this a competent agent or not? Then there's more nuance to it. It's not always good and bad. It's what's right for you. And for me, I think the number one, how do I put this? For me, the biggest question about is an agent a good agent or a bad agent is, is the agent always thinking about what's best for the player or is the agent thinking about what's best for them, right? right? There might be an instance where there's a team in China that presents a bigger commission for that agent or a team in the G League or Europe that that commission is way less. Does that age, is that agent able to think clearly and tell that player what they think is best for them in their career? Or is that agent going to say what's best for their commission? Hmm. If that agent has a relationship in one place, are they going to let that relationship cloud the advice they're giving to the player? Are they really going to represent the best interest of the player and what the player wants, or is it about them? And I think that's the so key is the morality, the ethics of it. Whenever I start representing a new player, I, I tell them, hey, my job is to be a reflection of you. If you tell me, go get me the most money, no matter what, that's what matters most, I will get you the bag. But if you tell me money doesn't matter, I want to go where I'm going to be happy. I want to, where my family will be comfortable, where I'm going to enjoy the quality of life and the money is secondary. It's my job to find that and money is secondary. So you have to really listen to your client and understand what they want out of life in their career and be a reflection of that. And it's going to be different for every person. So that's the biggest thing is I think some agents get lost in the sauce of just like money, 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 you know, ego, 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 power, power, power. But like you're doing yeah. lives. You're dealing with their career. You're dealing with some of the most important decisions they're going to make that are going to shape the rest of their lives. And so it should be handled with thought and with care and, and, and you know, ethically. Um, but aside from that, I think players should pick agents that fit their energy, right? Mm. If you like going to the club and wearing fancy watches and driving a Rolls, like maybe that your agent is into that too, no, right? No. But that's probably not going to be me. Right. But if you like meditation and yoga and uh, philosophizing on the uh, nature, <laughs> of health, I'm probably the agent for you. But it's like gotcha. I don't fit a square peg in a round hole. Right. If you find you find the fit. Right. I'm not going to be right for everybody. Not every player is going to be right for me. But it's more about finding who is the fit. That's going to make the most sense. Amazing insight. Well, Daniel, again, I want to be, uh, first of all, respectful of your time. Thank you so much just for taking the time out of your busy schedule uh, to hop on the platform, to share, to drop gems. How can people follow you and then like kind of plug, you know, what you got going on, man, especially your film and everything else that you're working on. Just find me on socials at Daniel Poneman on Twitter, on Instagram, on TikTok. I don't really use TikTok, but just find me, Daniel Poneman, <laughs> find me wherever. Um, I'm always here to talk. I'm one message away. I'll get, I get back to everybody. And uh, I'm appreciative of you having me on. This was a lot of fun. Great questions. I'd love to come back on at some point. I love what you're doing. I love what you're building. I love what the, the resource you're providing to young coaches and players. So let's do this again sometime soon. And thank you for sure. having me. For sure. For sure. Shot in the dark. What what platforms is that on? I think it's, uh, it's you can buy it on Amazon. It's on okay. um, Gooby. It's on, um, if you Google it, it's everywhere. Shot in the dark bet. or in school. Yeah, there you go. Bet, bet. Well, coaches, players, parents, everybody watching. Again, this is Corey Harris. Thank you guys so much for your time and for tuning in. 
Uh, shout out to Daniel Poneman. Like he said, follow him on uh, not TikTok, but everywhere else. And look up Shot in the Dark when you have the opportunity. Check that out. I know I will be. Appreciate you guys. God bless.